that you're building in him. Thank you for the excellence and the hunger for your presence and for your mission to advance here on earth that you've placed inside of him. God, I pray that you would continue to stir up the gifts inside of him, that he would bless us with his words, and that he would teach us to see you more clearly today. We love you, Jesus, and we pray a blessing over Nate. Thank you for him and the gift that he is to our body. We love you, Jesus. We celebrate our family. In your name, amen. I just turned my microphone on here. I'm going to bring these to you now. So everyone who's watching, these are Chief Ogrens from the North Muskegon Fire Department. He leaves his keys around at the church. Let's just pray for the chief, okay? Yeah, if the fire truck comes up missing, we know he left it somewhere. So. Oh! I know you guys probably can't see this, but his wife just confessed that that was him. She's taking the heat off of him. But God bless you, Sherry. Thank you. You're such a wonderful wife. You got to pass out of this home, boy. <laughs> All right. This, um, a lot of this stuff is just going to, it's probably stuff you guys have heard before. Um, it's, I'm just... It's a kind of a, I've never been someone who, oh, we're in this season, let's preach about being thankful because it's Thanksgiving or it's Christmas, let's talk about um, the birth of Christ. But over the last month and a half, I've, for me personally, just been in a, um, meditating on um, passages and stories and um, about thankfulness, being, being grateful about where we're at me personally, where I'm at, thankful for things in the past and then thankful for things that are up in front of us and where we're headed to and where we're going. And when, you're going, when you go through trials or you go through the storm, you recognize and you, become to, you come to a realization how powerful your praise is and how powerful just the attitude of thanksgiving in the midst of your circumstances really are. Thanksgiving has a supernatural power that can readjust your heart and can tenderize it and make it sensitive to the things that we need to be sensitive to as kingdom citizens. Many times, I know for myself, we, we, I've, for me personally, I got into a place to where from the time I came home from prison 10 and a half years ago, I watched God do some supernatural things, like supernatural miracles. And... And, and over this last, I'd say the last year, gotten to a place to where uh, I was impressed by what God was doing, which in one sense isn't really, and I hope I'm saying this the right way, so work with me as I guess it's the first time I ever shared this. You get to a place to where you can be impressed with what God is doing and what he's about to do in your life and what he does as opposed to just being thankful for what he's done. Two totally different things. And I didn't recognize it until I went through a number of storms and then it's like when you, when you internally you look to see, okay, the problem never is on your end, but it's probably on my end. So let me look to see where I'm at. And I got into a place to where I just got impressed with what God was doing as opposed to just being thankful. You know what? I'm just thankful. You know, from the mindset and the posture of heart that you realize and you recognize who butters your bread. And if we're not careful, we can get to a place to where we just get excited about the possibilities of being impressed by what God does as opposed to just being thankful for who he is and what he does in our lives. And there's times where we have to take a step back, especially when, when, the, when, the, when you see, when not only can you see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, but then you actually live in it. And it appears that every prayer that you pray in reference to the direction in which you know that God's calling you, you're seeing him not only answer them, but he's going above and beyond. And he's doing things that you never thought that he would do. 
and it will produce uh, this, it's a subtle thing, it'll produce an attitude of just being impressed. You'll brag on God, but it'll be from a, from a heart posture of just being impressed as opposed to just being thankful. And at times he'll send things in or allow us to go through certain circumstances because it's the only way that he can readjust your heart. Many times the storms of life and the difficulties of life are not, many times we'll blame God for those particular things, which he, God is in charge, but he's not in control. Okay? He's in charge, but he's not in control. And there'll be times when storms will come into our lives for the sole purpose of, to recalibrate and readjust your heart and make it so that the fallow ground of the heart can be broken up and it can be, it's almost like taking the tiller and tilling up the soil so you can plant new seeds to bring in a new harvest. Sometimes there has to, you have to go through the breaking in order to get to the harvest. In order to get the grape juice, you have to crush the grapes, right? There has to be a breaking before there can be the fruit that can be produced out of the seasons that we go through. So many times the seasons of these is not to come against us because we're never fighting for victory. We're never fighting from, from to, to, to gain something. We already have it. He's doing that because it's time to go to the next level. It's time to go to the next stage. And many times that next stage just may just be simply just a, a, a level of maturity. It may be a, a totally different perspective on how you see things. So what got you here won't get you there. And if there's not a readjustment, you're not going to get there. It's a faith thing when we're in the midst of these, in, these storms and trials. And he wants to readjust us internally that the only thing that we see is him. And that we know it's him from beginning to end. And it removes us from this... this, this um, this place or this paradigm of just being impressed. Some people can be, they have more faith in their ability to lose their salvation than they do in his ability to keep them. And when the heart posture is, oh man, I might, it, here's how it steals your, our thankful heart, our thanksgiving, our thankfulness, is every time something happens or I don't hit the Hit the, hit, you know, hit the mark or hit the, um, uh, the dart right on the bullseye, I think that there's something wrong with me, so I come back to me. Which there is, but what, like what Ray alluded to this morning, it's not who you are in spirit, it's just an unrenewed mindset. Is what, is what creates the, what we would call flaws. Every single one of us who have repented and placed our faith in Jesus Christ and surrendered our lives over to him, you're perfect from now until eternity. You and I are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And even on your worst day, you're still the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Because it's, it's, it's why Paul told the church at Corinth, it's by his doings that you are in Christ Jesus. In other words, notice what it didn't say. It's not by your doings that you're in Christ Jesus. It's by his doings that we're in Christ Jesus. And he, he, he wants to readjust our hearts to have a heart focus toward him. And so when we do that, we have to realize that we only have one thing that we can offer to God, and that's a thankful heart. Every other thing in this earth he owns, he possesses, it's his. It's not yours and it's not mine. The only thing... If you don't remember anything else out from today, the only thing that you possess, the only thing that you own is a thankful heart that's not already his. Turn to Psalm 50. One of the writers of the Psalms, Asaph, he writes this passage here because of what the, 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 really the condition that Israel had found themselves in. And so God inspired the leaders to go and confront Israel because they were doing everything from the outside looking in, from the outside of Jerusalem looking at Israel, everything seemed perfect. They were doing, they were keeping the law, everything 
was what God had called them to do. They were doing everything he told them to do. But then he sends some of the prophetic voices into the house to confront them about the only things that someone close to them, who is him, who could be that close, that could actually know the motive and intents of their heart because it revealed itself through their behaviors. But if you were outside the wall looking in, you wouldn't be able to see it. And so he raised up leaders to share this with him. Watch what he says. I'm going to start right at verse 7. Here's God speaking to Israel. And in a sense, he's almost bringing a judgment on them about where their hearts were really at, not where their behavior was at. Watch this. Verse 7, he says, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I do not reprove you for your sacrifices. Because they were, they were sacrificing the lambs. They were sacrificing the goats. They were keeping the, the laws of sacrifice. They were holding fast to them. And they were doing them. They were keeping them. Verse 8. I do not reprove you for your sacrifices. And your burnt offerings are continually before me. I shall take no young bull out of your house. Nor male goats out of your folds. For every beast of the field, forest, is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills is mine. I know every bird of the mountains, and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't even tell you. For the world is mine and all it contains. Shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of male goats? Now watch verse 14. Here's what he tells him. He says, but offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High God. He said, listen, he said, the, the, the goats, all the animals that you're offering up as a second, he said, those are mine. You're not giving anything back to me that, that's not already mine, that I don't already possess. He says, but offer a, 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 offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and in that you'll honor me. Well, think of a sacrifice. So we can put this in perspective. A sacrifice means what? It means something has to die right it means something has to die that means here here's here's the voice of thanksgiving remember this the voice of thanksgiving is always the voice of faith whenever thanksgiving leaves our lips and it comes from a pure heart when it leaves our lips we're we're literally releasing the voice of faith in whatever circumstance we're in it's easy to be thankful as long as everything's going your way right I'm good at that. I'm great at that. Fabulous at that. Now, when something happens that I don't like, my first inclination is to complain about it. And sometimes I'll even have a conversation in my head about it. I know none of you all have done that. Only me. Okay. But my first inclination will be, I can't believe that. And it will move towards a complaining thing. And then I'll have to be intentional about taking a step back and releasing Thanksgiving in the midst of it. What has to die? My flesh has to die. I have to die to my right to want to be right in this situation or right to want to justify a particular thing or the right to show that everyone else is wrong and I'm right and da-da-da-da. And you can go on. You can fill in the blank in your own situation. That part of us has to die and then offering up a voice of thanksgiving. Now watch the last verse in this chapter and look what he attaches to or does when the person who sacrifices, something dies, their flesh dies, and they offer up a voice of thanksgiving. Watch what happens. Verse 23, he says, he who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving, he honors me. And to him who orders his way aright, I shall show the salvation of God. I think the NIV translation says this, he who offers a a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me and he prepares the way for me to show him my salvation. He said the person who offers the sacrifice of thanksgiving, when we do that, we prepare the way for God to come into our lives, into our circumstances and show his salvation. Now, many times when we hear the word salvation, we just think of being born again, getting saved. 
Salvation is one of those words in the scripture. It's, a, it's one of those words. It's an all-inclusive word. It means if you could take salvation and you could switch it with the word deliverance in almost every instance in the Bible. Okay? Salvation, all-inclusive word, refers to health, to money, to deliverance of sickness, whatever, you name it. You'll find it in the scriptures. God says, I'll bring you salvation from the enemy armies, right? What was he telling Israel? I'm going to bring salvation. In other words, I'm going to deliver you from the hand of the enemy army. There was many times to think of Hezekiah. Remember, he was sick. And God gave him 15 more years. He told him, he said, I'm bringing salvation to your house. And you'll see this all throughout the scriptures where he'll bring salvation in whichever way is needed in that time to the people. So what, here's what he's saying to us. To the one who offers up the voice of thanksgiving, not only does he honor me, but I'm going to prepare a way for me to show him or her my salvation in whatever area of life that's needed. I think about that. What if my financial situation would be taken care of if I would just adjust my, the attitude of my heart? What if the storm of life that I'm in right now would be turned around in a matter of days if I just adjusted the attitude of my heart? What if there was something that I was dealing with, an ailment that was brought on by bitterness and that it, thing, circumstances would turn around if I just changed the attitude of my heart and just be thankful? Let's look at a couple examples of this. Turn to Jonah, chapter 3. This is always one of my favorite um, Favorite uh, passages with this, with, with this attitude of thanksgiving and being in the need of deliverance at that time. Many of you have read the story of Jonah. God called him, you know, to, as a prophet to go to the city of Nineveh and confront this, this city here about their sin. And Jonah didn't want to go. And God told him, he said, well, you're going you're gonna to go. And he said, well, I'm not going to go. And he jumps on the boat and heads in a different direction. A storm comes into his life. And they end up throwing, throwing him overboard, and he gets swallowed up by a great fish. Now listen to his prayer, his, how, their, his attitude adjustment, and watch what it brought into his life. Yeah, chapter 2, Jonah chapter 2, I'm going to start right at verse 1. I'm just going to read his prayer, and let's watch what happens. Verse 1, he says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish, and he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depths of Sheol. You heard my voice, for you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again towards your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains, and the earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Now see how he's prophesying now? <laughs> he's in the midst of the bay. He says, you brought my life up from the pit. He understood the power of his words. Verse 7, he said, while I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Now pay attention to verse 9. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. In other words, deliverance is from the Lord. The next verse, verse 10, look how God responds. He prepares the way of salvation. Then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up on to the dry land. While he's sitting in this thing, smelling like you know what, it's Sunday, so we can't use the word. He's sitting in there smelling like you know what. And he says, you know what? When it seemed like all hell had broken loose in his life, he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to offer up a voice of thanksgiving. You know what, God? Even in the midst of this, you're still great. You're still faithful. You're still good. 
You're still the God who's sitting on the throne in my life. You're still the God of miracles. You're still a great deliverer. And you will bring salvation to me because of who you are. Do you understand? It's, it's, it's not this. It's, it, the power of thanksgiving, here's what it does. It captures God's heart because it creates an atmosphere where he can literally come and inhabit your praises, inhabit my praises and rest there. And here's the thing. Whenever the king comes in the room, salvation comes with him. Whenever the king comes in the room, healing comes with him. Whenever he comes in the room, wisdom comes with him. Whenever he comes in the room, the supernatural has to happen because he's there. And he, it was just a change in the attitude, a change in what had happened. But did you notice what, why the supernatural, if you see the one thing that Jonah said in verse 7, he said, while I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. Have you ever noticed that when you get in the midst of you, a storm may come, it seems like we, we soon forget about what he's done before, all the times he's come through, all the times he's protected us, all the times he's guarded us, all the times when he was thinking for us, when we weren't thinking for ourselves. Many times when someone probably should have been in jail for a long time, but God thought for you and removed you from certain situations, removed people out of the way. Some of us sitting in this room probably would be dead right now if that wasn't the case. If he didn't actually think for us. And when we get in the midst of these things, we soon forget what happened. Now watch what happened to Israel in Isaiah, or Psalm 78. Watch this. You could read this whole chapter and it's about, it, it, he, he shares the whole history of Israel about just the cycle of defeat that they lived in. He goes through, he says, listen, but there's a consistent theme every time they went into bondage. You know what it was? <laughs> they forgot all the things that God had done and they chose not to be thankful. Watch this, I'm verse nine, uh, Psalm 78, verse nine. He says, the sons of Ephraim were archers equipped with bows, yet they turned back in the day of battle. Verse 10. They did not keep the covenant of God, and they refused to walk in his law. Verse 11, they forgot his deeds and his miracles that he had shown them. He said, here's why they went to bondage. They forgot his deeds. They had forgot what he had done. They forgot the miracles. And their whole attitude and perspective got consumed with their present circumstances, and they allowed the present circumstances to speak louder than what they knew he could not only could do, but would do, and they allowed the storm to speak louder than the voice of God. Now, it's easier said than done. I, I get it. I, ain't, I, ain't, I, don't, I didn't get an A++ in this one. Around about, about a C, but we're working. We're going towards a B, okay? It's easier to preach it when you're up here than actually have to do it, you know what I mean? I guess that might be one of the perks for the 30 minutes while you're up here. <laughs> but do you, do you get it? Like when you're in the midst of it, the attitude of wanting to be thankful, it's like, be thankful for what? What do you mean be thankful? Have you ever seen, told somebody to be thankful and they yell at you? I've had that happen to me a number of times. So just be thankful. You know, you got to change your attitude. It's like it makes them even more mad. <laughs> I know it does me too. I'm like, Shut up, man. I don't want to hear that. Right now. I'll repent later. You know what I mean? But right now, I'm walling in this thing. Feels good. But deep, 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 deep down inside, we know it ain't right, right? And then you know the way out is Thanksgiving. Because when we offer up the voice of Thanksgiving, it prepares the way where the thing lifts and there's peace on the journey out of the depression or whatever it is that's attempting to, to seep in there. But one of the things we can't forget is forget what God has done. He'll do it again. In every circumstance, if he's done it before, guess what? He'll do it now. If he's brought deliverance before in your life, he'll do it again. But many times you can't see it. That's what makes it tough because we can't see the end result. And we have to praise him even when we don't, we don't understand what's happening. But to praise him even when we can't see it. But to be able to praise him even when the circumstances are telling us something totally different. We still have to offer up 
the voice of thanksgiving so that we can prepare an atmosphere for him just to rest in. Because I guarantee you this, it'd be better having the presence of God with you while all hell is breaking loose than having the presence of God away from you and all hell breaks loose. At least in the midst of the storm, you'll have peace. At least in the midst of the storm, the person who has authority over the storm lives on the inside of you and he'll champion your voice. He'll champion what you release into the atmosphere where you can take authority over those storms because the peace of God is reigning in you because of our decision, our choice to be thankful. And one preacher said, you only have authority over the storms you can sleep in. If we can't sleep in the midst of the storms, then we don't have authority over it. And it's an attitude of the heart that has to change where I have to be thankful so that it prepares the way for the peace of God to come inside, for the peace of God to reign. The presence of God, uh, thankfulness, it'll prepare a way for us to be delivered. Also, let's turn to Isaiah 60. It does a couple other things. It'll protect your mind from going crazy. You ever had somebody tell you you're going crazy? <laughs> uh. I remember one time this guy, this is our side joke, this just went into my mind. I remember one guy, <laughs> he was talking to, he was joking around, he didn't actually tell her. He just, he said, you know, his, his wife was complaining about something, right? And he just told her, he said, oh, stop it, you're just exaggerating a little bit. He said, oh, hell would have broke loose. But he knew his wife, you know, it's, you'd have to know the circumstances and who it was. He knew, he said, ah, oh, you're just over-exaggerating a little bit. <laughs> He says, you know, I think about saying it, but I don't really say it because I know all hell will break loose in my life for that moment. <laughs> I said, well, you're a wise man. <laughs> ah, all right, get focused, Nate. Get focused. Get focused. Get focused. Isaiah 60. You guys ready? Verse 18. Violence will not be heard again in your land nor devastation or destruction within your borders. But you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Around uh, J Jerusalem and some of the other cities, here I, I looked up and said, why does it say gates and praise? In my mind, I think like the Jericho walls. Okay, they just had, you ever notice it's not Jer it's the Jericho wall. It's Jericho walls. It always has an S against it because they had, there was always two layers of, um, of walls that surrounded a city. You'd come through the first wall, and in between the next wall to get to the city is where they would have people out. They would be selling things, and people would come out and um, do trades and different things from um, it's almost like a farmer's market, so to speak, that would be around the wall. Uh, in some of the cities, they'd have a wall, and then they had a gate that was in the second layer of that, but it was the gate that actually gave you access into the city, okay? You notice this thing here, he says, but you, talk, telling Israel, you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Now, salvation is whose responsibility? God's. And praise is whose responsibility? Ours. It's this co-laboring relationship with God that he's doing his part with securing your salvation. And your response, my response to that is praise. And he says, here's the benefit of that. When, when salvation is mine and praise is yours, the walls and the gates, your praise, actually serve as walls and gates around the city of your mind to protect you from the attacks of the enemy. How many times have you gotten into a situation where your walls are torn down, it's not thankfulness, but you're harboring unforgiveness and resentment and bitterness, and it's just like every thought, every day, it just bombards you. The enemy has free reign because the walls are torn down, the gates are not there, and he has free reign to come in and destroy everything in the sanctuary. And you can feel it every day. Your attitude stinks, you're mad at people, you don't even know why. I don't know, I'm just pissed off, I'm just mad. I'm just, da, da, da. You say, well, why? I don't know! Well, because you're going crazy, that's why. Here's why. You will go crazy without thankfulness. If you're letting bitterness and resentment 
just bombards your thought life and it stays resident in your heart, it's going to eat you alive. And guess what? It destroys the walls and gates that are there to protect you. They become destroyed. And the enemy has access into the city of your mind and to run rampant. Until the attitude of my heart is readjusted and I release praise in the midst of the circumstances and I release praise not because of what's happening but just because of who he is. And I understand this, that he's bigger than any situation that I can find myself in. Right? If he's bigger than every situation that I find myself in, well then in the end we must win. Okay? And how many times have we seen situations where it looked like Israel was defeated or the people, or whoever, Paul and some of his ministry journeys in Acts, when it looked like it was over with, they weren't going to make it out of this. And then they turned in their praise and God was welcomed into the situation and he turned it around and he turned the situation around. He turned everything around. And you could see where God, how he responds to the very thing that is the hardest thing for us to do when things ain't going right. It's easy to get mad and yell. It's easy to harbor unforgiveness. It's easy to drink. It's easy to smoke. It's easy, you name it, cut somebody out, all that. It's easy to do those things. But the hardest thing to do is to be thankful for who he is in the midst of this thing. Now, I'm not telling you to go smoke and do it. I'm just, you know, don't go. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying, okay? Don't take it out of context, all right? I'm going to clarify that. I was sitting there. I was reading some of the words for praise this week. <laughs> this was funny. I was reading some words on praise this week, right? And I was writing them down. And listen to some of these here. So one of the words is shabak. It's a Hebrew word. It means to give thanks in a loud tone. It's sometimes you'll see it translated in the Psalms as shout. Okay? So sometimes you just have to shout your way into something. You know, sometimes you just don't be loud in church. Well, it's actually, it's a, it's a scriptural thing to do. A zamar praise it means to give thanks with musical instruments. Like what we do up here. Tada praise is a thanking choir. You see a choir, a praise team that's giving thanks into the Lord. Barak means to kneel in thanksgiving. So when, we, when you'll see people that will kneel in the front without even verbalizing anything, it's an act of thankfulness to the Lord. So it's speaking without saying words. It's speaking to those around, to the kingdom of darkness, and to the world that I'm thankful for who he is. Halal means to give thanks by being clamorously foolish. <laughs> I remember when we first started, boy, we attracted some, some, I mean, all the, there was a number of folks that would come, and you'd be like, what the... And one Sunday, they pulled all the Christian toys out too, boy. He had the shofar, you know, blowing the ram's horn, and the flags were going. And one guy, he was out in the middle. He had, uh, what's the round thing with the little thing? The what? Yeah, he had that thing, and he had, he had, I mean, and it was going. You felt like you was in an old Pentecostal camp meeting, a revival, I mean, that thing. And it was going, he, and then you had them all around. I looked around, and then there was people up shouting. I said, whoa, it was like they let the circus come in there. I said, we're a security Yeah, I mean, everything came out that time. <laughs> so that was a halal praise that morning. And then there's tehillah. To sing a song of thanksgiving. Te not tequila, tehillah. Okay. <laughs> Teque it ain't what produces the song of thanksgiving. Tehillah, not tequila. It might be appropriate for this house to make sure we clarify what we do not mean, okay? So everybody pay it. Tehillah, that means to sing a song of thanksgiving, right? You guys are a handful, man. Let me get focused. I got, they say I got like eight, ten minutes or so. 
So listen, the way to, per, it's, it's those different descriptions. And you, may, you notice, or you think sometimes in certain situations that you have to respond a certain way. You know, and there was, there's others, those were just a handful. Yadab praises when we lift our hands. When people lift their hands, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a, an action of thanksgiving. That we're just saying, hey, you know what? Father, I'm, I'm thankful for you. For who you are. Not necessarily what you can what, you're, what you can do for him, but just for who you are and what you've done because it's a representation of your nature. It's a representation of your heart. And, the, you know, certain si- situations demand a different kind of praise. They demand a different kind of thanksgiving. Sometimes it may not just be a song. Sometimes you might have to shout. Have you ever had God just rock your world sometimes? And you'd be by yourself? I do it when I'm by myself. I don't do it around nobody else. I'm going to tell you the truth. There's been some times where the Lord's blown my mind, and I do it. I make sure the windows are closed so the neighbors don't hear. Sarah ain't there, the kid, you know. And, and sometimes, because it's an overwhelming sense that you made, man, God, this is crazy. I, man, I got some testimonies for days. I remember the first one, this was, I, I, I was home from prison about 10 days. And I remember I was thinking like, Man, I didn't need some, you know, my clothes and stuff, right? So one of my dad's friends had passed away like three weeks before I came home. So I inherited all this dead man's clothes because <laughs> he was my size, right? I was cool with it. I had already decided I'm not going back to selling dope. We ain't doing this. We're staying full. If I got to wear Goodwill clothes till I get a job, I can buy my own stuff. I'm cool. But I inherited all these clothes. And I was okay with it. I was home about 10 days, and it was a guy I had discipled in the joint, said that God told me to buy you your clothes when you come home. And the UPS truck pulled up, and there was two boxes. Well, three boxes. Two had clothes, two big boxes, and then there was a smaller um, box. But these three big boxes came, and I, I thought it was just one. I took it. He said, hey, you got another one, too. I said, oh, and they were heavy, so I sat that one down. He got he said, oh, I think you got another one, too. I'm like, dang, what did this dude get me? And I grabbed the next box and put it down there. And I got up there. I mean, it was, every, it was socks, razors, shaving cream, shirts, shoes. It was everything. And I remember I was so overwhelmed, I couldn't believe it. And I remember just falling to my knees. And I was like, man, thank you, Lord. And it was just, an, it was another reminder of his faithfulness that, look, you're my problem now. Stop worrying about this stuff. Okay? You're my problem. I got you. And then literally five days before that, this guy, I, I, the day I met him, he said, God told me to give you a car. I said, you for real, man. <laughs> Don't play with me, man. We didn't play like that in the penitentiary. Don't play with my emotions like that, right? <laughs> he says, yeah, man, I'm serious. He said, God told me you got a lot of ministry to do. Said, oh, man. <laughs> that car soon broke down, but, I mean, it, it worked. It was small. It was one of them little uh, 1999 Toyota Corollas. I looked like, it looked like a clown car. I could stand up. Look, I could stand up on the top like this. And this was the roof. I get in there, my knees are, you ever see someone who's too tall in a car? And they, the knee is all the way up on the steel. It was one of them type of joints. And the seat only goes back so far. So a guy six foot and tall, it wasn't a good look for him, right? But, and some people would laugh at me. But I would tell them, at least I ain't walking. Right? I was thankful. I wasn't walking. It was clean, though. Had some 12s on it, but that thing was clean. For real. It was clean. It got me from point A to point B. And when people would say stuff, at least I ain't got a Schwinn bike or some Nikes. It's, it's getting the job done. And it did, but it was another instance where it just overwhelmed me. And many times you can get into the midst of the storm and you can forget all the stuff he did back here. I, you can forget 10 days after coming home, you meet your wife. Right? That ultimately changed my life forever. You, could, you can come home and, or anytime. You get in the midst of a storm, everyone, look back over your life. How many times are those mile markers where God 
showed up and he put his fingerprint on a certain situation in your life, and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt it was him, but it wasn't no one else. You know it wasn't anything in and of yourself that brought that thing about. You know it was, it was simply the pure goodness of God that showed up because of your attitude, because you chose to be thankful in the midst of those things, because you responded with a praise that God came in, and the only thing that I can give to him is a hallelujah. That's, that's the only thing I can give. I can give a halal praise. And you can look back over the circumstances of your life, and you can see the goodness of God. And then that sense of, when, especially when you start murmuring and complaining, I'd be like, dang, how did I forget? And you got to just take some time, just readjust your focus and get back, go back to the drawing board sometimes and be like, man, I'm getting full of pride now. <laughs> I'm starting to bleed my own press, you know? For real. Don't act like you guys ain't had them thoughts too. Start thinking it's you doing it. You ain't doing it just like I ain't doing it. You know, the air you're breathing is his, not mine. The grass that grows in my front yard that I have to cut is his, but he don't come and cut it, though. Okay? But I have to be a good steward of it as much as I don't like it. And I'm too cheap to pay them young kids, man. They, they, you know, they pay, they want $50 an hour now. Ever since they jacked up uh, minimum wage, like, man, little kids in the neighborhood come. I'm like, no, nah, I'm about to spend $5 on some gas and do it myself, listen to a podcast. But you have to be thankful for these things, right? In the midst of it. And, and, and here's the thing. The enemy will always attempt to come after our thought life to give us reasons to not be thankful. He'll come after us and he'll, he'll give you every reason to not be thankful for who God is and for what he's done in our lives. And we have to respond with a heart of gratitude. In every situation. What if we just develop that habit of just doing that? That every day we just say, you know what? Forgiveness is a choice. I'm going to choose today to be thankful. Even when stuff isn't going my way. Even when things aren't going the way that I think that they should. I'm still choosing to be thankful. And we watch what God could do in the midst of situations like that. Where we prepare the way for his salvation to be revealed every day in our lives wouldn't that be good if we just did that well as as we're you know, obviously going into thanksgiving but we go into a, a moment like this where it's you know let's just be thankful let's stand up and let's practice this You know, in Isaiah 61, Isaiah writes in the next chapter, he says, To grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of fainting. I just like the salvation and praise protects the city of our mind. It also protects our soul. And he says, if you put on the mantle of praise for the spirit of fainting, it's like putting on a big, well-insulated coat when it's freezing outside. And just like that coat protects you from the bitter cold winds that are blowing at you, so praise protects your soul. Your thanksgiving protects your soul from the attacks of the enemy. Because every single one of us has an enemy. The day you were born again, you entered into the conflict of the ages. Okay? And every opportunity that your enemy gets to destroy you, he's coming for you. He's coming for me. And he will play on our ignorance. If we don't know how to protect the city of our minds, we don't know how to protect our hearts, then he, for him, that's, that's, hey, that's, that works for me, baby. And he'll come after and he'll pump lies and suggestions into our mind with the sole purpose of just destroying us. Because he knows just like praise attracts the presence of God, murmuring and complaining attracts the presence of demons. And wherever demons are, there's gonna to be torment. When Israel went into to 
Babylonian captivity, you'll notice the first thing they said says, we hung our harps up on the trees. They had lost their song because they went into bondage. And when you trace it back to the why, there was a number of different things, but one of the, one of the consistent things was because their attitude, their attitude moved from there and got on their own circumstance and thought that they were the ones that were doing this. And so he sent them into bondage to get their undivided attention. And it's a sign that we've gone into bondage is when we lose our thankfulness for who he is. And he wants to bring us out. He wants to say, hey, come on, it's time to come up out of that mess. It's time to come up out of there. Even on our worst day, we're still the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Even on our worst day, we're still blessed, right? If we just sit back and think of, think of how blessed all of us are. Things may not be going the way that we want it to, but we're still blessed. Things may not be unfolding the way that we expected them to unfold, but we're still blessed. We still have reason to be thankful. And he wants to come in and he wants to rock our worlds. He wants us to give him permission to prepare the way for his salvation. To move us into a place of victory. And come out of that bondage. Let's just take a couple minutes. Do you know how to sing that song, Give Thanks? Remember the old school joint? Could you come sing it for us? No, because I'm not good. I can't hit the one tone when they get to thanks. I can't take it up to the next level. I'm on like one or two, so I don't want to. I might sing with her as long as I can drown it out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's do that together, all of us. Right? It's a real simple song. It's an old school song. So everyone over 40 should know it. Bob. <laughs> but it's a real simple thing. It just, it's simple. Let's just give thanks with a grateful heart. And let's just all enter into that together with one attitude, one voice. And let's just, let's just take the attention of our hearts and let's put it towards him. Because it, remember, it's always all about him. It's never about us. It's all about him. So let's all turn our attention as a family towards him and just give thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks to the Holy Here we go, Holy One. <laughs> Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Amen. Let's just this week, let's make sure we keep the posture of our hearts there. And it is times, I guarantee you, probably by this afternoon, your mind may shift off of that. Let's gently bring it back and keep it here. And as it drifts, just gently bring it back. Remember, it's a choice, and we have to be intentional about that. It's not just going to happen. Even when tough, you know what? You might be angry looking in that mirror, but praise the Lord. Even do it with your, <laughs> look, look, it's, it gets real sometimes. I know, if y'all ain't ever really been through nothing real tough, then you don't understand what I'm saying. Those of you laughing, y'all have been to hell and back a couple of times. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes you're just going to praise the Lord, brother. You know what I mean? Work your way up out that thing. You got to fight your way up out of it. Look, man, it's a choice. 
<laughs> you know, you might be pissed off. Praise the Lord. You know what I mean? Put a little fake smile on in the mirror. Get ready when you come out. And you got to do it. Here's what it'll do. It'll change the atmosphere on the inside of you. This is what needs to shift. Because as your heart is tenderized and it shifts, the atmosphere will shift. And your perspective, it clears up. You're able to see things from his perspective. And that's what we want it to be. Okay? We've got to be intentional about this thing. So this, today, this week, if we get off track, just gently bring it back. Say, no, I'm here to be, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm choosing joy today. I'm choosing to be thankful. It's a choice. And we can watch the salvation of God show up. And what we'll do is we'll actually prepare that way for him to step into whatever circumstances. And it releases the supernatural. Amen? All right. God bless you guys. We'll see you later this week.